This podcast channel is about you, successful international entrepreneurs, successful expats, successful investors, sponsored by ECJ Contacts. Okay, good evening to most of you and good morning to those of you in other time zones and jurisdictions. Good to see you. Uh, welcome to our webinar on US Spain taxes. So just a bit of housekeeping, please. Could you keep the uh, volume? The volume is off. I have it on mute. Everyone is mute. So please uh, don't unmute. And please keep in mind that we are recording this. So if it is that you do not wish to be recorded, you can feel free to turn off your camera. We will proceed as we have done this. I think some of you have joined us before from the names that I can see. I've seen some familiar names. So what we do is we have 20 minutes. I'm gonna talk for like 15, 20 minutes on US tax. My colleague, Ricky is gonna speak for 15, 20 minutes on taxes in Spain. And that frees us for the remainder of the time to do our Q and A. Thank you for those of you. Thanks to those of you who submitted your questions in advance. We have them, uh, and we will get to them during the Q and A. If you yourself have any questions right now, feel free to type in the box below in the chat box here in Zoom. Just just type your your question, and we'll def if time permitting, we will get around to your question. So without further ado, let me start sharing my screen. All right, wonderful. So I'm gonna talk about the, the US side for international entrepreneurs and expats who may or may not be based in Spain. All right, so just in terms of a bit of background about myself, uh, my name is Darren Joseph and I run a semi-autonomous tax team within Moore's Roland. So Moore's rule in Asia Pacific is a medium-sized tax practice, uh, accounting practice. We, most of our offices are in Asia. We have 30 offices in 12 countries. So as far north as Tokyo and Beijing, all the way down to Australia. I actually sit in Singapore this October. I would be eight years in Singapore. Because I am US qualified, I am required to say that nothing that we discuss here this evening should be construed as advice. For those who may be self filers and you come with pen and paper and you're thinking, you know what, at the end of this, I'm gonna be able to complete tax returns on my own. Definitely, definitely, definitely not. We consider this an education piece. What we hope you'll walk away with are some key concepts and principles that you need to keep in mind as you engage an advisor who knows your situation inside out. Again, this is not advice. We're having a general conversation about general principles. Nothing we say here should be construed as encouraging you to pay less than your fair share of taxes in any jurisdiction in which you're exposed. And of course, we have to say that to stay out of jail. Thank you. So when, when we say that the IRS has long arms and they reach overseas, these are the two examples of gentlemen that I like to use who have been caught by the long arm of the, of the United States, even though they're outside. If it comes up in the q and I'll circle back and reference them. But in the meantime, uh, I'll, I'll proceed without that. So the takeaways would be, I wanna talk about citizenship-based taxation. I wanna talk about the mechanism that the US government uses to figure out what you're doing overseas, even though you may not report what you're doing overseas. And as US exposed persons who reside outside of the US, I wanna talk about basic principles and we distill them into four uh, key, key words, I think, and an acronym that we call BEST, do your best. So we're gonna talk about bank accounts, estimated tax, state tax, and transfer taxes. I wanna to touch on stimulus payments because we've been getting quite a few questions on that. And President Biden's tax plan and what we can, the changes that we may expect to see. So that would assist you guys in terms of your forward planning because we like to look at plan, uh, taxes from a strategic perspective. <clears throat> All right, uh, citizenship-based taxation. I think it's 
pretty clear that the U.S. does practice citizenship-based taxation. Now, that may seem obvious to you guys, but believe me, there are still people out there who believe that they are not outside of the U.S. and therefore they're not uh, required to file and pay taxes. That could be cannot be further from the truth. Regardless of where you reside, you're required to file and pay taxes. It, it's, it's just the way it is. And yes, citizenship-based taxation is typically attached to two jurisdictions, well, aside from the U.S., Eritrea, a uh, country in the Horn of Africa. But, you know, uh, many other countries practice uh, worldwide taxation. And depending on the situation that existed when you leave your country of origin, many European countries, they have a fallback rule. So even though you reside outside of Europe or outside of your European country of origin, you're still required to file and pay taxes back in Europe. So the whole idea of being bound by citizenship is not new and it's not really restricted to the, the US. I mean, the US is extremely sticky in that you cannot get rid of it, but there are other jurisdictions where you're still required to file and pay even though you're outside. And the, the way these fallback rules are becoming more and more aggressive. So we think this is a trend that is happening, you know, across the developed world, to be honest with you. Now people ask, okay, yeah, 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 whatever. I'm required to file and pay taxes back in the US. How are they gonna figure me out? I'm all the way in Spain. I'm all the way in wherever. Who's gonna know? How are they gonna know? That's the answer right there. It's called FATCA the Financial Account Tax Compliance Act. So that was passed, I think, in around 2010 or so. And it empowered the U.S. government to go around the world signing bilateral agreements. So, for example, Spain has signed an agreement with uh, the United States, and they have basically set aside their domestic bank secrecy laws. And they require all financial institutions to go through their books and ascertain who may be U.S. exposed and report them to the U.S. government. So that's the check and balance. Even though you may not say, the banks and financial institutions are legally required to say, and not just banks, but we're talking about uh, like brokerage, uh, brokerage houses or cryptocurrency exchanges, <laughs> we're quite popular these days. But so any financial type institution is required to observe certain protocols and report U.S. exposed persons to the, the U.S. government. Now, like, like me, I'm sure many of you have more than one passport. So you go to sign up for whatever it is and you pull out your other passport. Now, keep in mind that even though you may deny or avoid the topic of being U.S. exposed, financial institutions are required to look for certain indices or indicators that you may be in, even if you deny it, without you knowing they are legally required to report you to the IRS. So that's that's how, that's how the system of check and balance that, that exists. What do we mean by US exposed person? So obviously if you have a US passport or a green card, uh, otherwise no, known as a lawful permanent resident, resident of the US, but there are other circumstances that may trigger that US tax status. One of which, which uh, happened I mean, it's been quite popular within the last year or so, given the travel disruptions, it's substantial presence. So quite a number of people have been disrupted. They're unable to leave. So they were trapped in the U.S. and unable to return to their jurisdiction of origin. And unintentionally, they may have become U.S. tax residents. Uh, and not just within the U.S., but other jurisdictions, people were trapped for a while and unable to travel. Uh, there's also the issue of what we call accidental Americans. So if you're born outside of the U.S., you may be born in Spain. But at least one of your parents was U.S. exposed and they're deemed to have been domiciled in the U.S. Whether you registered at birth at the embassy or not, you're a U.S. person. And we, we help clients catch up once they realize that they are U.S. exposed later on. But accidental Americans are very, very real. And then not very well known, there's a non-resident alien spouses. So a non-American spouse married to a U.S. spouse who would decide to make what we call a section 6013G election, where they elect to be treated as a U.S. person, even though they are not required to. Now, that could be part of your strategy, because again, taxes aren't just about filling out forms, it's about thinking strategically. If this is of interest, we can handle this in the Q&A later on. 
So what are the responsibilities of U.S. persons? Well, obviously, you need to file and pay taxes. That, 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 amount, that, that is pretty clear, right? But here, here's a trick, right? When it comes to international tax, the IRS is a bit counterintuitive. What do I mean by that? So when it's domestic tax, they want to make sure you pay. When it comes to international taxes, when you look at the schedule of penalties and charges for non-compliance, it's pretty clear that the emphasis is on information, not on filing and paying taxes. If you don't file and pay, okay, fine, you get interest or, or whatever. But if you don't report a bank account, if you don't report your investment in a company in Spain or whatever the case may be, if you don't report mutual funds or, or whatever in accounts outside of the US, that is not just civil penalties, but it also may be criminal. You can go to jail and the penalties are pretty dr draconian. Even the civil penalties are, are really aggressive. So it tells us that that's what the IRS wants and they become aggressive in you know post 9-11, with the Patriot Act going forward. It's all about information. The implicit assumption on the side of the US government, if you do not report what you're doing overseas, it is assumed that you are engaged in some sort of nefarious activity and they treat you as such. So report, report, report. If you're reporting bank accounts and stuff like that, it doesn't necessarily need to lead to tax liability. It's simply a reporting requirement. So here, you know, this, we're almost done with this side now. I mean, this is just a, I think it's a cool acronym, just a reminder of what your responsibilities are. So you need to do your best. What do I mean by do your best? So B, report all your bank accounts, as I mentioned, not just your bank accounts. Sometimes you would invest in uh, certain insurance products or certain pension uh, structures outside of the US. But when you look at it, it's really a wrapper and inside it's some sort of uh, mutual fund or ETF or, or whatever. You, these are, it tends to be highly nuanced and you should get advice, but they may be, treated in a special way with, where we can get into something called a PFIC, but just keep in mind that you have a responsibility to report financial investments or financial holdings outside of the US. E estimated taxes. Obviously when you're back in the US, you get paid on a W-2 and yeah, there's withholding. There's nothing much to do. When you're outside of the US, there's no withholding. So part of the responsibility of yourself working with your tax team is to work out what your income is expected to be and make estimated tax payments to prevent those underpayment penalties. State tax issues. Most states in the union are domiciled states. What that means is that you need to be particularly careful about the rules about tax residency. So in some states, even though you do not reside there and you've been living in Spain for a while, you may be deemed to still be resident in that state. So pay attention to what the rules are. Make sure that you've properly severed uh, state residency before you move on. And we, what, we, what we tend to coach our clients to do is just shift your domicile to one of those nine states without any taxes, particularly, you know, everyone likes Texas and Florida. You know, one of the, any of the states that are zero personal income tax states. So make sure that that's where you're deemed to be domiciled so you don't have any surprises when you re-enter the U.S. Last but not least, it's transfer taxes. And these tend to get ignored and overlooked. Why? Because they're not really mentioned in great detail in the tax code. I mean, in terms of uh, the other, the being resident for income tax purposes, you have section 7701, but we don't have much that speaks to domicile issues. So what we need to do is understand domicile issues. Domicile issue, domicile drives your exposure to gift and estate taxes. And the concept of domicile is understood through case law, not through the tax code. But basically that's where it, you know, that's where having a, an advisor comes in to make sure, especially as you're living outside of the States, you may uh, get into a relationship with someone who's not American and you receive a gift from him or her, or you may gift to him or her, even if it's a spouse, a non-resident alien spouse, the gifting back and forth may be reportable, not taxable, but definitely reportable under certain thresholds, when certain thresholds are passed. And then of course, there's estate planning. I know it's a bit morbid, but you know, hey, it's about taking care of loved ones after you, you, you pass on. So estate planning is, is something that you should not overlook, especially when you lead 
dealing with assets across in, in multiple jurisdictions. So yeah, please do your best. I'm gonna to touch on the stimulus payments because we've been getting lots of questions. Uh, of course, there've been two rounds. There was first round last summer and then the second round that was approved in this late December. And there's a third round, which is of course being negotiated right now as we, as we speak. Uh, if you did not get it and you qualify and you see the qualifications there, if you didn't get it, it's not too late you can file for a recovery rebate credit. So on the new forms, and one of the reasons why the tax season opened late this year is because the IRS had to revise the tax forms to include extra lines for the recovery rebate credit. So if you did not get it, just let your tax advisor know. And if you're expecting a refund, the refund will be higher. If you have a tax liability, it will be reduced by the amount of that recovery rebate credit. And if you have questions around this, please check the website. The website is, is really comprehensive. There's lots and lots of Q&A. The IRS has put, I put a lot of effort into keeping the, up, the website up to date. Check it out. In terms of filing requirements, uh, there's some often confusion around the foreign earned income exclusion. Some people say, confuse the threshold for the foreign earned income exclusion, which is around $107,000 with a threshold for filing. The threshold for filing is actually quite low. So if you're filing separately, married filing separately, if the threshold for filing a U.S. tax return this year is actually $5. So if you made more than $5, a tax return is expected, a tax return is due. The foreign earned income exclusion is it's something else. It's a, a benefit that comes to U.S. persons that work overseas, and it's a benefit afforded by Section 911 of the tax code which relieves, which provides an umbrella of protection of the first 107,000 or so. It moves with inflation of your income protects it from, from a U.S. tax liability. That's something quite different, which we can discuss later on if there's any misunderstanding on that. Most of our clients are higher income earners. So some of the questions that we field, um, you know, from time to time is, hey, where's my free money? Why didn't I get my money? And we need to explain that there are phase outs. So when you earn more than a certain amount, the amounts on the screen, the amount of the, of the stimulus payment would have been reduced or completely eliminated. So for those of you who are also high income earners, that this could be one of the reasons why you didn't get it if you were expecting it. So now we're getting to President uh, Biden's tax plan. Now, it was pretty, for those of you who looked at it, it was really a lot. Uh, when, uh, when he was campaigning last year, it was, you know, the document was circulated as pretty comprehensive. Obviously, it cannot be covered in its entirety right now. So what I did is I, I just kind of pulled out some of the key points that might impact those of you who are abroad and within the demographics of the people that we normally interact with. So for those who are higher income earners, there is proposed, these are all proposals and who knows what's gonna happen once there's negotiation with Congress. Uh, it may be completely different, but at least this is a starting point as we understand it. So for high income earners, those earning over $400,000 expect a tax increase. For those who run their own companies, the corporate income tax rate is expected to raise from 21 to 28%, which also has an impact on guilty for those who have structures in offshore jurisdictions like BVI, Caymans, uh, Singapore, where I am, Hong Kong, Malaysia, and so on. Uh, the, the amount of the guilty tax, which is a tax you pay on earnings that are retained within the company, that's, that's set to increase. There are also some changes around the, the lifetime exclusion for gift and estate taxes. So that may have implications for you as you plan, uh, you, you know, you engage you in estate planning or your succession planning with your companies for those who own their own companies. So those, those are some of the, the, the key points that I, I wanna pull out in terms of what do you expect to see as negotiations continue. So again, it's not too late to speak to your advisors and get some strategic planning done. So with that, what I will do is hand it over to Ricky, who will talk about Spain.
Hi, good good afternoon to everyone. Uh, good morning to some of you. Uh, so, well, my name is Ricky Gutierrez. I'm I'm from Barcelona, Spain. Uh, I'm from Gutierrez Pujadas and Partners. Uh, it's an international accounting tax and, and law firm in in Barcelona, Spain. Uh, we mainly mainly well, we are we do both international and and Spanish taxes. But we are currently, for the past few years, we've been currently focused on on international tax and international clients. We we deal with many jurisdictions, uh, not only Spain and the U.S., also uh, jurisdictions such as Ireland, uh, the Netherlands, the U.K., Germany, uh, and even some East uh, countries. Um, First of all, um, I'm gonna speak about the, the Spanish tax here. Um, nowadays, well, and also in the past, uh, the Spanish taxes have been pretty complex because you have to differentiate in between state tax and, and region. Because here in Spain, um, the percentage of taxes, it depends or it may uh, differ. Uh, depending on the state or the region that you that you're that you're in, for example, there are three communities in in Spain, uh, Navarra and the Basque Country. They have their own tax system. It's it's different from the other part of Spain. Um, if you, of course, if you if you miss or you don't file your taxes, you can get severe fines and and penalties. The Spanish tax year, it runs from January to, to December, unlike other countries. For example, the UK, it runs from, from July to June. One of the, the big benefits that we have here in Spain is that we have many, many tax treaties. Uh, as you will see, we have uh, over 100 double taxation treaties. And the two main or the two most important uh, taxes for individuals are the income tax return and the, and the wealth tax. So first thing and a very important thing, um, how do we know if we are tax resident in Spain? Well, you have to, to see if you meet one of those three rules. Uh, the first one, if you spend more than 183 days in Spain within a single calendar year, um, you will be a Spanish tax resident. If you don't meet this first rule, then we would go to the second one, which is uh, your primary professional activities if they're conducted in Spain. And the third one would be your main interest. For example, if your spouse or your children uh, which are still dependent on you if they if they live in Spain. The the Spanish the Spanish income tax. Uh, Spanish tax residents they 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 pay income tax on their worldwide income, while non residents only pay tax on the income generated in Spain. As as I saw some of the questions some of the questions I received from from Darren. Uh, if you are generating incomes, if you're not tax resident in Spain and you're generating incomes outside of Spain, you won't be paying for those incomes on your taxes in Spain. You will only be paying on the income you generate in Spain. Um, of course, uh, you can have deductions with the, with the expenses. The, there is a 19% tax rate for the EU non-residents. It's a flat rate and a 24% tax rate for the rest of the world non-residents. Uh, the Spanish income tax is divided in two categories. You have the general activities and the savings. Uh, of course, as I mentioned before, uh, the Spanish income tax, it can, it's different depending on the, um, on the region that you're living. But for example, uh, in Catalonia, normally it, it, it should go up to 45, 47%. But for example, in Catalonia, it can go up to 54%, which is pretty high. 
uh, a pretty high rate. The, the non-residents, uh, the form for, for to file the, the income tax for non-residents is the form 210. Now we'll go into the different two, two categories from the, from the income tax. The first category is income from savings. Uh, these incomes are basically interest from the savings you have, uh, dividend payments, income from the life assurance policies, income from annuities, and gains made from the disposal or transfer of assets. Since, 20, since 2016, the, the tax rate on, on savings, uh, these are the following incomes up to 6,000 and go 19%. From six thousand to fifty thousand, go to twenty one percent, and income uh, over fifty thousand, it goes to twenty three percent. As I was speaking uh, earlier with um, with Darren, uh, with the current government that we have, they've been trying to implement new taxes or uh, implement higher taxes. But since their um, since their government is not as strong as it's supposed to be or as they would like to be, um, they were they were unable to pass on their their new tax system. So so we are still staying with the with the tax system we had before, with a few changes, but but not many. Um, the general income tax. Uh, it's income from employment, uh, it's salaries. You have some pensions and rents. Uh, the Spanish income tax rate uh, based on employment, uh, it's income from up to 12,000, uh, it's 19%, 12,000 to 20,000, 24%, 20,000 to 35, 30%, well, and of course you can see the, the percentage. Uh, the, um, for the, for the income tax, the, um, you, when, whenever you have to file your, your income tax, the, it, um, the time for you to file the income tax, it goes from, from April to, to June. So in less than a month, the, the income tax campaign starts for, for individuals. Um, inside the the, per, the individual income tax, uh, you have personal allowances and, and deductions. Of course, Spanish sex residents have personal allowances, while non-residents don't have any deductions and allowances, which is unfortunate. But of course, uh, <laughs> Spanish sex residents should have some some benefits. Um, some of the allowances that you can have is are if you have um, people over 65 years of age living with you, if you have children that are under 25 uh, and they are still living with you and they are depending on you. Um, and these are these are some some allowances that you, that you can have. For example, if you have a uh, person living with you which is disabled um, you, with some disabilities, the, you can have allowances too. Uh, for example, you can have allowances and deductions for some of the pensions you may have, uh, or if you pay like the social security system, you can have some deductions in that. Now we get to, to one of the, the most important um, taxes for individuals, which is wealth tax. Um, with wealth tax, there have been, this, this tax has been reinstated and uh, introduced, removed and reintroduced again, because uh, let's say the, if you compare it here in Spain to the US, the, the, Democrat, the Democratic Party uh, they are always trying to implement this kind of taxes while the Republicans would like to, to avoid these taxes because they say it's better for wealthy people. Um, these people is basic, this, this tax is designated for people who hold significant worldwide wealth. Uh, 
they declare assets after tax allowance of uh, 700,000. For example, in Catalonia, the tax allowance is up to 500,000, which is less than the normal. Uh, you can also have uh, 300,000 tax allowances if you more for your primary residence in Spain, if you are tax resident in Spain. And the tax rate goes from 0.2% to 2.5%. In Madrid, there's no wealth tax, but the current government, they are wanting to, to implement wealth tax in Madrid. So currently, most of the wealthiest people, which hold a lot of uh, wealth, they are living in Madrid because of this tax. So for individuals, and this is very important, uh, we have Form 720. Form 720, it's an overview of the individual's worldwide assets. Uh, it's for individuals that they come live in Spain and they become tax residents. And they have to declare all their assets that are abroad. And uh, these assets have to be worth more than 50,000 euros. What happens is that a lot of people do, that come and live in Spain and become tax residents, they, they don't know about this form and they forget to file this form. And then a couple of years later, when they declare their income tax, since uh, in your income tax, you have to, to declare some of your assets or what are your possessions, uh, they, get, they get fines and, and penalties for not presenting the, this tax. Some of the fines can go from 30,000 euros to higher amounts. Uh, this form, you have to file it. Uh, once you become tax resident, you have to file it the following year uh, in between the 1st of January until the 31st of March. So uh, if you become tax resident in Spain the past few the, the past year and you haven't filed this form, you still have time to do it. Property tax. Um, owning a property in 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 Spain um, and in, yeah, and living in there from 1st of January, you're subject to, to some taxes. One of the, the taxes, uh, it's called IBI, it's in, Impuesto de Bienes Inmuebles. Uh, this tax, it applies to both residents and, and non-residents. There are also uh, some other type of property taxes such as rubbish collection tax. And also you have transfer tax. For example, when selling a property, uh you you will be taxed for for that depending on the amounts that you that you sell your property now capital gains uh capital gains are taxes on profits from from selling a property or or their investments tax residents in spain pay capital gains uh on their worldwide assets while non-residents they only pay capital gains on their uh tax gains that they have made on, on a sale of a Spanish property. Capital gains is a tax that is easier for, for non-residents because they, they are subject to a flat rate of 19%, while for uh, Spanish tax residents, you, it can go up to 23%, sometimes more. The, the corporate tax, uh, nowadays corporate tax in, in Spain, it's 25%. Uh, for newly formed companies, uh, they pay 15% the first two years. The, the tax year, uh, as well as the, um, as the individual tax year, it, it goes from January to December, uh, and you have to declare the the corporate income tax it has to be paid before the 25th of july of the of the following year uh, of course also with the with the current government they are willing to increase the corporate tax to to 30 percent but they haven't been able to do it yet uh, 
from my point of view, I don't think they will be able to to increase this tax rate. But well, let's hope <laughs> they don't. Uh, another tax that we have here is inheritance and gift tax. The, this tax it's uh, a little bit tricky uh, and it's not easy to calculate because um, well. Individuals, they are subject to tax when they are transmitting or gifting assets. Um, tax residents in Spain are, as I mentioned before, they will be taxed based on their worldwide assets, while non-residents only on their Spanish assets. There are a lot of reductions in these two taxes based on the degree of kinship. For example, it would be less expensive if you give something or if your uh let's say <laughs> your daughter or your son they inherit something uh rather than giving it to someone you you don't know to a third person uh the last thing that we're gonna be i'm gonna be talking about is a special tax regime uh, that a lot of people knows uh, that it's for foreigners that come to work here in Spain. Uh, we are talking about the, the Beckham Law. The Beckham Law, it enables uh, foreign people to, to, to move to Spain. Uh, and instead of um, going from the percentages that we spoke about when presenting the income tax, they have to pay only a flat fee of 24% on the incomes they they obtain in Spain. The the flat rate uh, of twenty four percent it's up to an amount of six hundred thousand. Once you are above the six hundred thousand, you will be your percentage will be increasing on the in the progressive tax. So you will be paying forty five percent or more uh, over the six hundred thousand. Uh, this uh, this law, I mean, the per, the people that is going to be moving to the Spanish territory, it's going to be paying this 24% only the first six years that you are in the country. After that, you become Spanish tax resident and it works as I explained before. So the main requirements for, for to apply to this law, uh, the expat, can have been a Spanish resident in, in the past 10 years. The, the foreigner must have a job contract and signed by a Spanish company. So if you're coming here, but your, um, your job is with a company that is outside of Spain, you can apply to this law. It has to be with a Spanish company and with a Spanish contract. And uh, directors that come here, uh, they can possess more than 24% of the company and the core of the workers' professional activities must be in Spain. If you have any questions. All right. So now we get to the, the fun part, which will be the Q&A. So let's get to the list of questions i'm just going to read them first because for people who may be watching the recording afterwards they won't see the questions written as you can see it in the chat box so okay i keep getting different answers so this one question is maybe, maybe you can clarify i have a rule over ira and a roth ira in the us i was told by hacienda in madrid back in 2012 when I physically went to inquire that the IRAs did not have to be put on Form 720. Now I'm hearing from various persons that this is not so and that they need to be disclosed. What is the correct answer? Uh, Ricky? So <clears throat> what I mentioned before when I was talking about the Form 720, um, when we speak about the Form 720, we declare the assets we have, we don't consider uh, the pension an asset. So in this case, you wouldn't, even if the pension is higher than the 50,000 50, euros, uh, you don't have to declare the pensions in the form 720. You will declare the pension in the income tax. Okay, gotcha. Thanks. Next question. 
a uh, couple questions. Number one, I'm a registered freelancer in Spain. I'm going to be releasing an ebook by my own website soon, this month. And I'll be using a third party platform to facilitate payment. I will have to add an additional economic activity to my list of activities, but which one would be recommended for my specific situation? And also which tax rate will be associated with purchasing an ebook? Ricky? Yeah, so of course, if you're um, doing another activity, um, that is not your main activity or it's not the similar as your previous activity, you would have to go into the thing that we called uh, EIA uh, and you would have to, to check which epigraph uh, matches your activity. In this case, I checked before and it should, um, when we are talking about online selling, um, we, we would recommend doing the, um, the 665, uh, which is basically the direct selling. Regarding the, the ebook, the percentage of BAT that it, you should apply to the to the ebook, it's 4%. Uh, at the beginning, we, we, we didn't know if for ebooks you had to increase it since you were using like a platform and all that stuff. But, but I checked and it's only 4%. Uh, for the second question, uh, yeah, I don't know if you read that out loud. Uh, not yet, I'll just read it out quickly. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's from the same person. So if I've been offered a freelance teaching position three hours per week, but the company only issues contracts to all of its employees, do I still invoice them or uh, as I would, an invoice them as I would another client to take into account retentions or what do you suggest that I do? Okay, so here you can do uh, two things. Uh, if, you're, if you're saying that the, that the company or the school or whatever, they, they, only, um, they only issue contracts, you can be both a freelance and you can also be in the... Um, uh, in the general regime so you can be contracted as well and if you don't want to be contracted you can also invoice them as a as a freelance you can do both things so that shouldn't be a problem of course if you invoice them you would have to uh to take into account the the retention it would be probably 15 percent Okay, gotcha. Uh, moving on to the next question. I've contacted a few companies now, all focus on just the US side. Do you guys help in filing both countries? The answer is a definite yes. And you're right, whoever wrote that to insist, because if you're just doing the US side and being completely blind to Spain, you might put yourself in trouble with Spain and vice versa. So you need to work with a team that understands both sides. Uh, next question. Uh, I'm living in Spain, but getting paid to a U.S. bank account by a U.S. company. Is this an okay arrangement? And how does this affect my taxes? Uh, Ricky, you want to talk to the Spain side? Uh, I mean, it is okay, first of all, though we would need to know. I mean, you're living in Spain, but we would need to know where are you resident? Are you resident in Spain or in another country? If you're resident in Spain and you're receiving income from outside Spain, uh, to a U.S. bank account, I mean, you wouldn't have to declare that on your income tax because, uh, well, sorry, if you are if you are non-resident in Spain, you wouldn't have to to declare this in your income tax because you only have to declare incomes generated in Spain. If you, in case you are tax resident in Spain, of course you would have to declare this uh, this income in your income tax. And uh, regarding the, the bank account, um, if you haven't filed the Form 720 and your bank account is over 50,000 euros, you would have to uh, file the Form 720 and declare that you have this, uh, this amount or this income. Right, and, and from the US side, well, US is pretty simple. Worldwide income, doesn't matter what, it needs to be reported, pretty simple. 
Uh, next question. Does real estate owned overseas need to be reported? Uh, I'll, I'll answer it from the US side. If it's an income producing asset, the answer is yes, you declare the income on your tax return. If it's not income producing, but you hold the real estate through a structure, it may have to be reported on Form 8938, which is the new FATCA, relatively new FATCA form. Uh, Ricky from Spain? Yeah. What? The, what this, question is that? this is another question. Someone sent it to me directly. Does real estate oh, okay. owned overseas need to be reported? Uh, well, of course, it depends on whether you're you're resident in Spain or, or not. If you are resident in Spain, of course, you have to declare all your worldwide income. And in case if you have uh, some something outside of Spain, you'll have to report it as well. Yeah. Okay, next question. I'm considering purchasing a property in Spain with my partner. How could the purchase impact me when I found my US taxes? Or is it advisable to leave my name off agreements? Well, again, that's kind of connected to the previous one in that it depends. If it is an income producing asset, you, it, you're gonna Airbnb it, you're gonna rent it out or whatever, then that is gonna be reported on your tax return as it would be regardless of where the real estate is located. But if it's going to be just occupied or you're just going to have it as a holiday home or you're going to live in whatever, then it doesn't produce income. So it doesn't need to be reported except if you hold it through a structure. So if you're going to hold it through some sort of corporate structure, then it needs to be reported potentially on Form 8938. Uh, moving on to the next question. How do taxes apply to someone with a Spanish non-lucrative visa? Ricky? Um, with a non-lucrative visa, I guess you will still be considered non-resident. So you would only, you would only be paying here for your income generated in Spain and you will still be paying, um, for all your taxes in the other country that you're resident. Okay. Yeah, here, in order to become a tax resident, you have to meet the three rules that I mentioned before, or you could always buy a golden visa, which is pretty expensive. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, next question. How are IRAs, individual retirement accounts, SEPs, which are simplified employee pension plans, I think, and deferred investment accounts taxed here, here being in Spain? Uh, Ricky? Well, uh, as, as I mentioned, um, we would have to, regarding pensions, we would have to, to take a look at the, the Spanish tax treaty uh, with, the, with the US uh, and see whether they are taxed in the US or not. Uh, and probably um, regarding the pensions that we are talking about, some of them you might get if you, for example, if you have, if you're paying for those uh, pensions in the U.S., probably you would get a, a refund here here in Spain. Uh, well, you would pay in both in in one country. You would get a refund, uh, but of course, we would have to take a look at which kind of per, which, which kind of pension are we talking about, and if they are taxed or they are not in in the other country. That's why. Yeah. But you just, will, of course you you would have to declare them in the in your income tax. Right, and just to just to add to what Ricky said, when it comes to pensions, that's pretty involved. Uh, on my website on hcj.tax, we have like a block section. We have over one thousand articles free on various tax issues. So. Out, as a result of a back and forth email conversation that I had with Ricky, I actually was able to draft uh, like a, a sort of primer on how Spain deals with US uh, pensions for those who are tax resident in Spain. Uh, it might be some pretty heavy bedtime reading, but it, it does provide some sort of insight. And again, this speaks to the point that we raised earlier where yeah. when you have a US person doing US taxes for someone who's resident in Spain and they don't understand both sides, it's gonna get messy. So it's really important to understand both sides because when it comes to pension, that's a 
a real use case as to how both sides interplay and the treaty comes into uh, treaty is needs to be referred to to prevent double taxation because that nobody wants double tax and this is this is an example where it really comes into force uh next question hi ricky this one's for you hi ricky if i were to inherit a property in the u.s pending sale how would this be treated um so if you inherit a property in the u.s of course we would have to to get advice regarding inheritance in the in the u.s uh uh see if you would have to pay taxes there uh, and probably if you pay there maybe you would get a, an exemption here but of course we would still need to know if you were your resident because if you are not spanish tax resident then you don't have to pay any taxes here in spain for for that um, in for that property that you inherit uh regarding the pen the pendings i mean mm, we would still need to know uh of course mm, the amount of the sale because <laughs> it is different uh if we if we are talking about like a really high uh value or a lower value but as i mentioned before we would need to probably seek advice on the on the us side regarding inheritance because from what i know it's kind of different uh like the taxes uh regarding inheritance are different from from spain hmm. yeah i don't know if you can add something to that yeah right now uh the thanks to the tax cut and jobs act the estate tax threshold where tax might actually be triggered assuming someone is u.s domicile now this is where the concept of domicile comes in right because it's if it is so again we can't rely on the u.s tax code because it doesn't get into domicile when it comes to estate and gift taxes so we need to look at case law so the case law tells us that uh the courts in the u.s look at intent plus deliberate action so if it is and i'm just being completely extreme now if it is when you were leaving the u.s you did, you streamed yourself on Facebook Live, you got all your friends over to your apartment and said, I am gone. Goodbye. Yeah. I'm never going to see you guys again. <laughs> I've sold everything. The US is no longer my home. I'm out. Then you can make the case that you are domiciled in Spain and no longer domiciled in the US. And therefore, the threshold may be lower from a US tax as a state tax or gift in a state tax perspective, as, as opposed to uh, if it is that you were still domiciled in, in, in the US, right? So in which state it'll be higher. So it really depends on a lot of moving pieces is the answer Yeah. Uh, from, from the US and Spain side. So again, you need to sit with a team that understands both and we need to work it out, so. Yeah, and of course in this case, uh, we would also have to take a look at which was the value of the of the property at the beginning and which is the value that we're selling because we can have a capital gain mm. and, and of course you have to pay capital gains for 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 that in in your income tax in spain yeah and for those so in the, in the us estate taxes are levied on the estate to so the person who's passed away the mm -hmm. that that the, that estate would bear the burden not the person who's receiving but okay. uh, just having having said that historically we've had what we call a step up in basis because you again to the point where capital gains right because when you sell your inheritance you're going to pay uh tax on, on the on the difference right now you yeah what you get up up until this point is the basis or the, the the cost price for determining what the capital gains uh, amount would be, would be the the value at the point where you inherited it. So you get this uh, step up in basis, and that's particularly so for those who have used a trust as part of their yeah. planning structure. Now, again, this is for those who are thinking strategically under uh, President yeah. Biden's plan. They're going to do away with that step up in basis uh, potentially. So again, this is an opportunity to think strategically about uh, about your situation. Uh, moving well, on, because we just sorry, Ricky. 
Yeah, well, bad thing here in Spain, we don't, we don't recognize the figure of the trust, but <laughs> it's okay. Okay, cool. Um, next, someone is writing, uh, if I didn't file a, a Form 720 last year, Ricky, will I be penalized for filing this year? Uh, I mean, if you didn't file it this year, I mean, there are some certain ways that we can, uh, of course, we would have to take a look at the and see um, what are the things that we didn't file. Um, but of course, I guess we could, we could try to find a solution to see uh, so you don't have to, to get any penalties. But if you take at the, let's say at the law uh, thing, of course, if you didn't file it last year and, and you file it this year, probably you can get like a small fine. But mm. probably <laughs> with our help, I mean, we'll help you out to see the, we'll help you out so you don't have to, to get any fines and we'll try to find some solutions. Uh, for you so you don't get any any penalties for that okay that's great uh someone is asking ricky could you put your email address in the box down below they're asking for your email yeah. address. i know you i know it's somewhere up but i think it's got pushed up with all the messages and while you're typing that someone is asking if you purchased a home in the u.s for less than 50 50 000 euros many years ago do you have to declare that on the form 720 and if the value now is more than 50,000 euros, do you still have to declare it? Uh, yeah, if you purchased a home uh, well, or a property and it's over uh, 50,000 50, euros, yeah, you have to, to declare that. But the form 720, you just file it once. I mean, mm -hmm. you file it once and then it's okay. Because if you... Uh, if the value of that home increases, I mean, mm, nobody's going to know until you sell it. Once you sell it, then you probably, if the value is higher, you're, you're going to have a capital gain and you would have to declare that. But, but the file, uh, the form 720, you only file it once. Okay, that's great. Uh, next question. The non-lucrative visa requires more than six months in Spain. So you, you'd be a tax resident and would have to file even though the visa itself does not allow income generation in Spain. I guess someone is just making a comment. I don't think that's a question. Okay. Uh, next question, I think. Our income is entirely from U.S. Social Security and from dividends from U.S. companies. How much are we protected from Spanish taxation since we're already paying taxes uh, on this income. Uh, well, again, typically you won't be taxed twice once we get to invoke the, the treaty. And even if Spain does insist on taxing it, which many times they, they would, then we can use a certain form to recharacterize the income and therefore get your credit for the taxes you've already paid to Spain. So the bottom line is that once the team that you're working with knows how to leverage the double tax treaty between Spain and the United States, you won't pay tax twice. Uh, Ricky, you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, as, as we, as I mentioned before, <clears throat> if you are, if you pay taxes, I mean, the, the double taxation treaties are made so you don't, you don't pay taxes twice. So if you pay taxes in one place, probably uh, they can require you to pay taxes in the other country as well. But, but with the help of uh, people like us, such as tax advisors and all the stuff, we can help you out. So you can ask for, for refunds. So you then get double tax. Okay. If we are Spanish residents who moved here, at the end of July 2020, do we need to fill out the form 720 this year or next year? Also, I've heard that you need to make payments throughout the year. Is this true, Ricky? Uh, so if you came to Spain um, at the end of, of July, 
it means that you weren't a uh, tax resident the past year because you were in more than 183 days. So you will need to, to file the form 720 in between January 1st, uh, 2022 and the 31st of March, 2022. So for this year, you're okay. You're gonna become Spanish tax resident uh, in 2021. You're gonna have to file the form 720 in like in the dates that I mentioned in 2022, and you're gonna have to file Spanish income tax in in 2022. Uh, regarding the the payments throughout the year, yeah, that is correct. You have to make uh, quarterly payments, but these payments, uh, once it gets to your income tax, for example, uh, when you present your income tax, you deduct those payments that you made before so you're not paying more for example if during the year you reached uh you paid more than what you want your income tax saves then you're gonna get that money back okay so regina we're at the top of the hour do you have time to go through some more questions or do you need to go uh yeah i have 10 more minutes yeah no problem Okay, let's see what we can get through in 10 more minutes. If you have a sure. huge back question. So after five years of non-lucrative visa, I'm now getting my residency. Can I take advantage of Beckham's law now, starting in year zero? Or because I've been here five years already, will I only have one year? Ricky? Uh, the thing is that uh, we would... Mm, I mean, if you have the non-lucrative visa, we are we are saying that mm, you were in tax right in Spain. So when we talk about the Beckham law, uh, the first requirement is that you can be tax resident in Spain for the past 10 years. But we would have to take a look because um, maybe since you've been living here for for already five years, maybe they would consider that you that you are of course resident here uh we would have to take a look at this situation uh, but yeah we would have to take a look i cannot give you like a a certain answer now because i'm not sure okay All right ne next question uh are gains in tax deferred investment accounts in the u.s considered income in spain uh, this was part of what we answered in that back and forth email. So I, I think I mentioned that before, if you go to my website, hg.tax and you look at blogs, we have, uh, I've written over a thousand articles on international tax and related issues. And we did, uh, out of a conversation Ricky and I were having, we came to uh, like a primer. It's not a how-to guide. So don't use it and go file a tax return and point fingers. It, it, what it does, it, it pulls out the, the key concepts. And, and we get into this idea of a tax deferred investment account and it's triggered to Spain. Uh, so I, I just want to go through quickly because Ricky only has 10 more minutes. Someone foreign tax credits, we've been filing US taxes. We do not understand how and when this credit applies. This is one about foreign tax credits. Uh, again, it's highly nuanced and it, 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 you know, to make sure you don't pay tax twice we leverage the treaty and some unique aspects of the US tax code to make sure you don't pay tax twice using foreign tax credits using form 1116. We can't go into it right now in terms of a how-to guide, but we're saying that it does exist. It can happen. When you speak with your tax team, they should be able to, to walk you through that process. Uh, okay, here's an actual question. What if I sell my Spanish property for $1? That, that's a, an unusual one, Ricky. What do you think about that? I mean, when you sell something, you you have to sell it by a, somewhat like a real value. You cannot say, okay, I'm going to sell this by one because the tax authorities, they do investigate this kind of uh, sales. Okay, good. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of weird to sell a property for for one dollar i mean when when whenever we we do um we we take care of the of sales of properties and all that stuff 
you have to to do like a big study you have to to take into account the real value of the of the property and then from that real value maybe you can play a little bit with the with the value of that but not just say okay i'm gonna sell my property for one dollar because probably the tax authorities won't believe this this sale yeah it does seem a bit suspicious um uh kristen your question uh, we answered it. Yours was the first question we answered. We yeah. play the recording again. Uh, you'll be you'll be able to see it. Uh, we'll have the recording at HCJ.tax once it's posted live. Uh, someone else is saying I have double citizenship, so I guess maybe just a comment. Uh, next, what services does do your firms offer? Do you work together to complete U.S. and Spanish taxes for U.S. citizens, Spanish residents? The answer is yes. We offer. Uh, dual, well, both sides, cross-border tax planning, as well as compliance. Uh, as Ricky mentioned earlier, he does more than Spain, US. He does Spain and many other jurisdictions. And our team, we do more than US, Spain. We do US and many other jurisdictions as well. Uh, I have three more questions, um, two more questions in another platform. Someone is asking, okay. if, if you become a legal Spanish tax resident in 2021, would you have to file 2020 or 2021 for the Spanish tax year? I uh, think that's kind of obvious, but Ricky? Yeah, I mean, if you become tax resident in 2021, you'll be filing income tax in 2022. Okay, great. Yeah. And, the, and what I think is the last question, not sure if you can... Uh, I'm an American living in Spain. I will move back to the States for two years for work and then come back to live in Spain, hopefully forever. From a strategy perspective, when it comes to investing for retirement, would your recommendation be to invest in Spain or to invest in the US knowing that long term I'll, I'll need the money back in Spain? I believe there'll be tax implications in both situations. That's a uh, a different type of question, Ricky. You want to take a stab? <laughs> I mean, it it depends on whether you. Uh, I mean, I cannot. It depends on the person. Exactly. Uh, if you really like Spain, I mean, of course, there are many many places here in Spain. They're really beautiful. Like, uh, but it, it it depends on whether you want to invest in. It's up to you. I mean. Mm, if, yeah. you, if you invest if you if you invest here there are many opportunities there uh for example now with COVID, and unfortunately a lot of people uh is selling many properties and wealthy people it's uh taking advantage of that because some yeah. prices have <laughs> gone lower uh but of course yeah there are many opportunities here and of course as well there will be many opportunities in in the us and it's up to the person uh, but if you mentioned that you want to be living in Spain in the future, maybe it's good to have a home here in Spain. I don't know. Uh, if you buy uh, a property here and you use it as your primary residence, you can get some deductions from that. So maybe that can be a good reason. Okay, yeah. So I don't know about you. Yeah, definitely, Ricky. When it comes to like investment, and retirement planning and stuff like that. It's more than just tax, right? It You yeah. really need to sit down with an advisor who understands, who has a conversation with you and is able to advise based on a knowledge of both jurisdictions. So yeah. you, you need to speak with an advisor. And with that, thank you, Ricky. Thank you everyone for joining us. I, I yeah, thank you, you everyone. You derive some pleasure. Value. Yeah, and it, everything will be available live on hcga.tax. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Here are four ways we can help you. Number one, sign up for free webinars on U.S. Expat Texas and International Entrepreneur Texas at www.htj.tex. Number two, stream premium educational videos at www.htj.tex. Number three, Contact us for tax optimization consult over Zoom. Number four, high net worth. 
weekend quote for doing your U.S. international taxes returns. Our books and upcoming events are available at htj.tax. Please subscribe, like, share, and comment below. Email us at help at htj.tax to engage us to advise on international tax or business matters.